Okay, welcome everyone to another EBFA webinar. I absolutely love creating these free webinars because they keep that curiosity going. It adds into a lot of the topics that I'm speaking about through conferences that I'm at, blogs that I write. And then if you happen to be certified in our courses, primarily our barefoot training specialist or our new neurosensory specialist, then this is a way that you can really keep challenging those concepts or evolve off of what you already understand. Uh, my name is Dr. Splickle. If this is your first time taking any sort of webinar or education from EBFA or myself, welcome. Uh, in addition to being the founder of EBFA Global, I am a functional podiatrist, a human movement specialist. I see patients both in person and virtually. My in-person office is here in Arizona used to be in New York City, and now I am in sunny Arizona. And then I am the CEO and founder of Naboso. And I'm going to talk about a special promotion that we have through Naboso. We actually had done this webinar and promotion through the Functional Aging Summit about maybe six weeks ago now. And I wanted to do it again because one, the topic was so well received. And then two, it was such a great opportunity for people to integrate Naboso into their practice and with their clients and get free education at the same time. So we do have an opportunity at the end of this webinar to get free education, free courses, and that has up to a $250 value. So that is a great opportunity. Make sure you follow me and Naboso on Instagram and social. All right. So what we're talking about here is walking, but really the characteristic of walking that is going to be matched towards predicting longevity is going to be walking speed. So the speed at which us or our clients or a loved one family member is walking is actually referred to as the sixth vital sign. And there's a lot of research publications. If you want the research article, just email me, uh, provided my email address already by Fritz et al. And he really lit, looks at and breaks down this walking speed and how it is a very reliable, sens sensitive predictor to all over morbidity and mortality. And what they've seen is that as we start to slow down, you can see these parallels in changes in the quality of life that is impacting independence. If we start to feel that we are isolated, we don't move as much, we don't move as quickly, we don't get as good of that total body, but really cerebral blood flow that is supporting brain and total nervous system uh, circulation and protect protection. So movement is important with age and with life and longevity, but we do want to make sure that that movement is at a specific speed that we can get that vascular response within the body. Um, so really, really important to make sure that we are thinking about that with our clients. Now, when I read this article, I, I found it very interesting, the research and the correlations of walking speed and mortality prediction, let's say. But the thing that the article fell short on was it didn't give any sort of solution. It was kind of like saying, okay, I'm gonna take your blood pressure, see that it's elevated, and then not tell you anything or give you solutions on how to either prevent it from going higher or to manage it in this current state. And as movement specialists and allied health professionals, that then what or the prevention of this potential decline in walking speed is really where our specialty comes in. So I wanted to do a webinar that really answers that then what really, really what is affecting the walking speed that our clients or ourselves are walking at. And these are going to be the big three determinants of walking speed is going to be first balance. So it is our ability to stand on one leg. How, how long can we stand on one leg? How truly stable are we when we are balancing? And why single leg stability is so important to walking speed is that step length, which is a huge determinant in walking speed, 
is dictated by your ability to stand on one leg. So this period of single leg stance, which is characteristic in human bipedalism, is a necessary component to being able to take a long step, okay? If you are not able to stand on one leg well or long enough, you are going to shorten this single leg stance or what's called mid stance period, and your steps become shorter and narrower, which will go into our second one, which is mobility and that joint range of motion. So another component of being able to take a long step is I have to have sufficient mobility. So that, that mobility is not just in the ankle and in the foot, but a lot of it actually has to do within the pelvis and the T-spine. And can I do these big reciprocal patterns with my rib cage and my pelvis so I can take a long step? Step length is very much as much of a foot function as it is to a hip and pelvis slash T-spine function. So we wanna make sure we're thinking about that. And then finally, number three is going to be really this fascial flexibility in the connective tissue component of walking. And I think a lot of people forget or overlook that when we move efficiently and effortlessly, we are really moving fascially. So to take nice long steps that is going to support a sufficient walking speed and a transfer of impact forces and potential energy, we have to have a certain component of fascial flexibility or tissue hydration. So let's go into the first one. And what we're going to do is we're gonna break down each of these. So we're going to look at balance and walking speed. What's that correlation of kind of alluded to this already, right? But our ability to stand on one leg is one of the most important developments in the evolution of human bipedalism, right? We need to be able to stand on one leg. And one of the biggest differences between the way that a human walks and the way that a primate walks is that we have this single leg mid stance period during our gait pattern that no other animal has to the same degree. So we need to be able to make sure that we are optimizing that. Now, something that could potentially be contributing to this with our clients, especially that older client, is certain medications is going to compromise balance. Maybe they have diabetic neuropathy, idiopathic neuropathy, chemo-induced neuropathy, something like that, uh, compromised vision, vision, uh, changes with age, very common. Hearing loss, especially unilateral hearing loss, can be a great contributor to impaired balance. And then anything central nervous system, so MS, Parkinson's, things like that, history of a stroke, is going to affect their balance, which is going to affect their ability to maintain that mid-stance, single-leg stance period. They will therefore have to shorten their steps, and that will change their walking speed. So when we do a balance assessment, if we are doing a Romberg, so a Romberg would be with your feet uh, together as an initial one, arms crossed, eyes can be open or shut, and then you're just looking at medial lateral sway. Now, medial lateral sway has been shown to be a direct correlator or predictor to fall risk. So the more the sway, the increase the fall risk. Now, on all of my patients, I will do a single leg stance assessment. And I want to see that someone can stand on one leg for 10 seconds, right? Can they just stand, transition from two legs shoulder width apart to single leg standing 10 seconds, okay? Now, if they fail or have a impaired balance assessment, we then want to start asking ourselves, well, why is that, right? Is it because they just don't train balance and they need to incorporate balance exercises into their programming? Could be, it's a skill, right? And it's a skill that most people don't train on their own. Uh, or does it have to do with some of these other reasons over here that is contributing to an alter perception of the ground? Do they just not feel their feet and where their weight distribution is? Do they not understand their foot type? 
and maybe they're over pronating and collapsing so they're not sitting on their tripod and what is referred to as a plantar grade foot. So we have to teach them to understand what a foot tripod is. Maybe they have too much cushion in their shoes, so it's too soft and is further contributing to a loss of perception of the ground, or they just have this inherent foot weakness that is contributing to hammer toes. And as we start to get hammer toes, we lose what's called toe flexor strength, and then that compromises balance, right? Or maybe it's a combination of all of those, okay? What we want to start to do to improve the balance and that single leg stability in the client is that we want to make sure that they can feel the ground. This is really the purpose behind barefoot training. Why I've been advocating barefoot training for the last decade is to get out of the shoes. I call it barefoot baby boomers so they can take their shoes off. They can feel the ground, feel the tripod, get that stimulation. Can we look at their shoes and get them out of the cushion and into a more minimal environment? environment? And then can we integrate the Naboso insoles or the Naboso socks so they can actually feel the weight distribution? Can they feel the tripod easier because of the texture underneath their feet? So I would do a combination of all three of those things, right? The Naboso products in a minimal shoe is an awesome environment and then still interweave barefoot, no shoes, no socks. Okay, from an improving of the foot strength is doing foot specific exercises such as the forward lean, short foot, you know that I'm going to talk about that one. Short foot is of course activating that foot to core connection because a big part of balance is also feeling our center of gravity. Both the forward lean and the short foot are targeted towards toe flexor strength. So that toe flexor strength is very important. And then whole body vibration is good. So if someone is so balanced, compromised, that we need to start doing certain things seated, totally fine, you could put the feet on top of the vibration platform, turn it on, and it's going to mimic the activation of impact forces to start to strengthen the foot. And they could just be sitting in the chair. Great way to start it. Or revitive, which is neuromuscular stimulation, kind of like a TENS unit. Really great system. Um, I speak about it a lot with my patients. Uh, the website is revitive.com. You can see how it's spelled on the website. And it is essentially inducing these muscular contractions, kind of like whole body vibration, little bit different mechanism to induce it but kind of a similar parallel effect uh, from the whole body vibration. The biggest difference between whole body vibration and NMS or like a TENS unit is you don't see the positive effect to the bone and to bone density where you do get that in vibration, okay? So those are what you would want to do. For that forward lean, I have videos, just real quick, I have videos on the forward lean and the short foot, the vibration, and then the revitive, I have videos on um, my YouTube channel. What I do want to do before we go into the mobility is just talk really quickly about this forward lean. So I'm going to have everybody do that now. And if you are familiar with the forward lean or you've heard me teach it before, then just kind of bear with me for one moment. So if you want to join me, I'm going to have you stand up with your feet shoulder width apart. Hands are going to be by your side. And we are going to start by finding that foot tripod. So we're going to go underneath the first metatarsal head, fifth metatarsal head, heel, lift your toes, spread them out as wide as you can and place your toes back onto the floor. So we are getting into a more stable foot position. Uh, typically I will cue the patient to also just rotate a little bit externally to lift that arch slightly. And then what we're going to do while staying on our tripod is arms stay by the side. You're standing nice and tall. Imagine that you're as stiff as a board. And then you're going to slightly lean that body forward and then come back to the center. So I'm going to rotate to the side. I know that it's not the best from a zoom perspective, but I'm standing nice and tall. Arms are by my side. And then I'm going to slightly lean my body forward and then go back into a vertical position, relax my toes. Lean forward. As soon as I do that, I feel my toes gripping into the ground, 
and then back into a vertical position. One more, lean forward, toes engage. It's a reflex, you don't have to do it. It's just a reflex. And then back center, relax your toes. So I will use that forward lean just to start to kind of activate, wake up, right? It's fluid, you're like a tree in the wind, right? And it's just a nice, easy way to start to wake up your toes and say hello, okay? Awesome exercise. And then I typically take the patient into a more focused, short foot activation technique, which would be just a further pushing of those toes down into the ground. Okay, that's your first one. That's the balance. Let's look at the second one, which is going to be mobility. Now there's four main areas that we are referencing from a mobility perspective that affects walking speed. And that is going to be our T-spine, our pelvis, our ankle, and then our big toe. If you do not have sufficient mobility in any of those four areas, it's going to start to lock up the other areas. So if my big toe doesn't have enough dorsiflexion, I'm not going to be able to take these long strides with my leg behind me, which means I start to shorten my step which means I no longer extend my hip the same, which means I no longer rotate my T-spine the same. So it's a common pattern that I see is that if you take away one area of mobility, it's going to compromise the other remaining three, okay? Now, T-spine and pelvis mobility, as it relates to gait and walking speed, is that the T-spine and the pelvis are in close association with each other. They're, they're synergistic, they're you know, married in a sense. This means that if we lose mobility in one area, we most likely lose it in the other. Now, one way that you can drive T-spine and pelvis mobility during gait is something that drives reciprocal arm swing. So this could be using something like walking sticks, a really good way. Uh, there's a product called Smovi, S-M-O-V-E-Y, Smovi. This is a weighted ball bearing uh, handheld device that as you swing it, the ball rolls forward and back in this uh, loop and there's ridges and it's essentially creating like a vibration stimulus and you can feel the momentum of that ball moving. This is also where I would probably recommend our sensory sticks at Naboso because they're weighted so you can start to get a little bit of a momentum pattern through it, okay? Now, one of the biggest things that I see is that modern society and the way that we walk or don't walk uh, in today's modern society is that it's actually really contributing to these changes in step length or stride length. So essentially two steps make a stride, okay? Um, so I might kind of interchange those. So step and stride length uh, can be shortened based off of increased sitting. So people are much more sedentary. So their hip flexors and their pelvic mobility starts to get locked up. So they're not able to take as long of steps maybe it has to do with the pattern that people walk. So if a lot of people are walking around their home, they're not really outside, we're obviously not out in the wild hunting like we used to. So people take very different steps nowadays in today's society. And as we get older versus uh, perhaps, you know, uh, your walking in Manhattan as part of your daily routine. Um, I know that since moving from Manhattan to Arizona, which is much more driving, I do not walk the same. I don't take the same number of steps. I have to be very conscious of how many steps I take a day, but then the quality of the steps that I take are very different because I used to commute, you know, 15, 20 minutes easily to walk from the train to a destination on a time restriction. So I'd have to walk really fast and take long steps and get good arm swing. And I would do that every single day. Um, and that just fed my body and my fashion, my mobility. Carrying purses or laptops, if you have anything on one side and you're carrying a purse and you're swinging one arm and not the other, it's going to change your T-spine and your, your pelvis mobility, right? And then modern footwear, heel, toe drops, rockers, high heels, all of that stuff can affect step length and stride length. So what I'm going to show, hopefully this video will play. If it does not play, I will talk you through it.
but I'm going to show you what is a T-spine and a pelvis mobilization that I do with my patients and I recommend to my patients on a consistent basis as a way to, okay, if we do this little reset every day, we're going to open up pelvis and T-spine and how they work together. Let's see if it's going to play. I don't think it is. It is not. Okay, no problem. I'm going to show you now. So what I'm going to have you do is if you want to join me, you're going to stand up and you're going to put yourself in a position like I am in this video. So I'm going to rotate here. You're going to put yourself in a position that you are with one leg forward, other leg back in a lunge position. I want you to slightly tuck your pelvis under exactly like the photo. Okay. Arms are by your side, keeping tucked. I'm going to have you shift your body forward. So I'm shifting in my lunge. I'm going to shift forward 10 times. As I do that, I'm feeling this opening up in the front of my left pelvis, my back leg pelvis. On number 10, I'm going to hold 10 all the way forward, still keeping the pelvis tucked. I'm going to bring my arms all the way up over my head. Keeping my arms over my head, I'm going to reach nice and tall, and I'm going to lengthen. Just doing that is awesome, right? I'm getting increased opening up of my left pelvis. So I'm going to reach and lengthen to get into my fascial system. Still reaching tall, tall, tall. I'm now going to pulse 10 times forward, and I'm going to lift through my sternum. So I'm lifting, 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 right? So I'm pulsing back 10, 9, eight, keep going all the way back 10 times, just like you can see in the photo. On number 10, hold, and I'm turning my palms so they're facing forward over my head. I'm now going to paint a ra rainbow. Keep your back pelvis tucked under. And now we're gonna paint a rainbow. So I'm moving this way. Okay, essentially we're going now in the frontal plane. I'm painting a rainbow 10 times. After I do 10 times, I'm going to hold center, move my arms in front, keep my pelvis tucked. I'm going to rotate 10 times in the transverse plane. Okay, so we're doing this and we're opening up the pelvis and the T-spine in the transverse frontal in sagittal planes. We would then essentially repeat on the other side. So I would bring my left leg forward, my right leg back, exactly like the picture. I'm gonna tuck my pelvis under, get into kind of that lunge position. And then I'm just gonna start by pulsing, pulsing 10 times. Once you pulse number 10, you're gonna hold. Arms go over your head and just reach, 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 reach. I like to hold here for a moment and just get into that fascia. Once you're in the fascia, then we're going to pulse 10 times in the sagittal. After that, palms face forward 10 times in the frontal, paint your rainbow. After 10 times, arms go in front and then rotate in the transverse plane. Okay, doing that on both sides. So that is a great way to get the pelvis and the T-spine mobilized on a consistent basis. Okay, this is something that for people who sit for work, I would have them do this every day. Um, I actually program this out for quite a few of my patients on as part of a daily reset that they would do. Okay, very easy to do. And then I would want to incorporate what is a foot release. So this foot release is one that we teach through Naboso. We use our neural ball for it. And essentially what you do is you would stand on the neural ball, you would split the neural ball into two pieces and you would do a pinpoint pressure release each point for 30 seconds. And I'm gonna show you on my hand where those five points are in the foot. And then you can try it if you happen to have a neural ball or if you don't, then you could easily take advantage of our promotion that we're doing. So this would be point number one put this on here. Point one is going to be the heel of your foot. So this is my hand, of course, but it's going to be on the foot. So heel of your foot, middle of the arch is position number two. Number three is going to be the ball of your foot. So you're just moving your way up. Easy, easy. Number four is going to be on the side of your foot. And then number five is going to be your medial arch. 
case you just you have these five points that we are releasing with the neural ball domes standing on each spot for 30 seconds go to the next spot 30 seconds next spot 30 seconds and it's a great way to get a foot and ankle mobilization that is done every single day so that's that mobility reset that i want to make sure that we are getting for optimizing gait speed okay all right so that is our mobility our third has to do with the elasticity of our connective tissue so the rubber band effect of our fascia now where this is really important is that in order to walk fast enough and to walk fast enough for long enough right so we need to have not just good walking speed but we need to be able to maintain that walking speed for a long period right we can't burn out or run out of energy fatigue out okay which means that we have to start walking efficiently to teach your clients to walk efficiently means that they have to be walking fascially. And that's actually what's designed. Our body is designed to move efficiently. Our body is designed to not burn a lot of calories when we walk, which is why when you walk to lose weight, you essentially will start to plateau after you start to build up your efficiency, right? It's, it's just inherent in the nature of moving fascially. So to get fascial, you have to have the proper connective tissue health. And that's a big part of it, right? And what happens to our connective tissue health as we age is that it starts to become a little bit more dehydrated. Maybe we have some free radicals and inflammation in our body. We get what's called cross-links, non-enzymatic cross-links. They're like kinks in our fascia. Maybe we have an injury history of Achilles tendonitis year after year. So now we have degeneration of our Achilles tendon, uh, or maybe we're just getting overall tightness of it because we're just not moving enough, right? So it's very common to have age-related changes in our connective tissue. Now, these are just some of the big ways that you can start to support connective tissue health, especially with age, is hydration. Hydration is not just you need to drink enough water, it's a part of it, right? But you want to hydrate your connective tissue as well. And a big part of how we hydrate our connective tissue is through moving, right? So moving requires flexibility, fascial flexibility, but movement is how you hydrate that fascia to maintain flexibility. So it is a little bit of a, um, not a catch 22, but you're kind of one is feeding the other, which is really important. Um, another great way to hydrate your fascia is through different myofascial work. So doing compressive techniques and then allowing that hydration, some of the more superficial myofascial releasing can bring in hydration, but you want to be thinking about keeping sufficient connective tissue hydration. Okay, injury history, understanding that inflammation is stickiness. So every time you get a flare up of plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis or whatever it might be, that inflammation that is associated with the acute irritation actually causes stickiness. So it causes a contracture of the connective tissue. Um, I will explain to patients uh, with like a bunion, this is really common with bunions, um, with a bunion that has irritation in the joint, you can actually get a capsular contracture. So part of what causes limited first MPJ dorsiflexion is that you don't have enough joint space. And part of the loss of joint space is that the capsule is pulling in on itself because of inflammation. It is a capsular contracture as response of it. So stretching the joint is beneficial to open up and allow a little bit of relaxation of that sticky joint capsule. Okay. And then from a diet perspective is having a lot of sugars, um, anytime you have elevated blood sugar or glucose, your body can create free radicals that are called AGEs, advanced glycation and bodies that create these crosslinks or these kinks in your fascia. This is not just in diabetics, but a lot of people get an age-related 
change in their response to blood sugar. So their ability to process blood sugar changes with age. And it's just, you know, your pancreas is getting tired with age, kind of like everything else starts to get tired. So it is easier to create these glucose free radicals with age because of that. So maintaining a um, healthy diet or a low inflammatory diet, or really thinking about the fascial tissue in relation to inflammation is very important, especially in that aging client. So what I want to do before I go into that is to recap some of these concepts and then open the floor for any questions that you guys may have as it relates to walking speed and these three different areas. I then will share about the EBFA courses that qualify for uh, free education and then talk about the Novoso integration as well. So we had walking speed, right? So you have this walking speed as a predictor of mortality in our clients. Now, if you assess the speed, right? So you can just note changes in speed. Someone is walking um, to slower than they used to, right? And typically you will see this happen 75 and over. You, you'll actually see quite dramatic changes in walking speed, okay? But regardless, as you see walking speed start to decrease, the three big areas of what's contributing to the change in speed in that client is they don't feel confident or have the skill to stand on one leg long enough to carry a true mid stance position, which is necessary for a long step. Long steps correlate to walking speed. If they have to shorten their steps because of a decrease or a fear of falling during that mid stance position, then we want to think of what can we do for the client to help them feel more confident in the mid stance position so they can stay there longer and take a long step? Is it feeling their feet through Naboso products, getting them barefoot, teaching them how to find a neutral, strong tripod foot, teaching them to build intrinsic foot strength through their digits and how your foot connects to your center of gravity and center of mass through your deep front line. So we have to connect that foot to core, right? So that's a lot of the foundation of EBFA's education is balance techniques to optimize this mid stance position. So that's the first one. Second one was really looking at the T-spine and the pelvis mobility that is required to take a long step. To take that long step, I must be able to open up my pelvis. And as I open up my pelvis, my rib cage has to move. So if you think about this and even kind of stand up if you want, if I'm going to take a long step with my right leg, my left arm is going to come forward and my T-spine is going to rotate in opposition of my right pelvis. So I have this counter rotation, this opposite rotation that happens between the pelvis and the T-spine. To have sufficient mobility to do that is required to take a long step. If I don't have good mobility in my rib cage or my pelvis, I can't take long steps. I don't care how flexible you are in your big toe and your ankle, you cannot take a big step. So we need to make sure that we are unlocking the T-spine and the pelvis to take those long steps. Okay, so if you got the balance, you need the T-spine and mobility to take the long step. Of course, your big toe as well, but the big toe, I'm going to do a whole PowerPoint and webinar on the big toe. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be happening uh, in a couple weeks. Okay. So we've got that, the big toe, right? All in big toe. Okay. Third is then going to be in order to take a step with my right leg, swing my opposite, right? And then I essentially do the same. So as I do this, when I'm walking, of course, I'm exaggerating it, but as I do this, you can feel and imagine how there's these cross body patterns in both the front and the back of my fascial slings that get 
essentially potentiated and then recoil, potentiate and then recoil. So you have to have a certain component of elasticity in your connective tissue, both T-spine pelvis, so those are your, your functional lines, but then also in your plantar fascia and your Achilles tendon, because that's where elastic recoil is really released. It's stored and released within the body to walk at a certain speed for a long time, which is movement efficiency, right? So those are the three big areas for the um, connective tissue is really looking at how to keep that connective tissue hydrated. This is what's on the slide right now. For the mobility, we went through this mobilization of the T-spine and the pelvis that you can easily integrate. But honestly, it has to be all three components. It can't be just one. And all we do is focus on the balance component and overlook the other two. It has to be all three in um, succession or completion to really tell the full story for the client to optimize the demands of a sufficient walking speed. Okay, good. All right. I hope that makes sense. I hope that started to kind of open up some, some ahas or yes, or just that's exactly what I thought. That's exactly what I'm doing. Good job keep doing it, right? So that's kind of where we're at with this topic. I absolutely love this topic as well. Now, as far as the opportunity for everyone, so these are the four courses that qualify for free education. So if you've not taken any of these courses through EBFA, you can get any of these courses for free by spending just $100 at Naboso. So naboso.com is the website. This is globally. So all of our websites, $100 equivalent, 100 euro, 100 AUD, 100 CAD, whatever the currency may be, spending a hundred and then you will get a free course. So what you wanna do is if you make that purchase, you're just going to email orders at naboso.com and say, this is my order, here it is. This is the course that I would like to take. And then we'll push you into any of these courses. It has up to a $250 value. It is our ability to help you take this education to the next level to really integrate these principles. And since we are deeply integrated with Naboso in a lot of our techniques, it allows you to do the same as well. All right. And this, just so you know, will be available through Sunday. So Sunday, Sunday, what day on Sunday, the 16th, you will be able to take advantage of this. So if you're listening to the recording, this is through Sunday, October 16th. Okay, what I'm going to do now is answer some questions that you guys may have, and you can type those in. Uh, so Diego says, how much do you take into account the mobility of the subtalar joint performing adequate inversion eversion to affect single leg stance? So yes, um, Diego's question ties into how I teach someone to be able to find a neutral position. So a slight rotation and lift of their arch in certain people who have ligament laxity and will collapse too far into a pronated foot even though they can consciously lift the arch and rotate as soon as they're walking walking is a subconscious pattern from the body they will start to fall into it i might actually have to recommend orthotics and people with ligament lax over pronation that is happening into the midfoot oftentimes have compromised balance because they don't have a stable base through which they can balance. So very common to see over pronation, poor balance, over pronation, poor balance. The ligament lax type, I will then recommend orthotics, which many people are surprised that I would recommend orthotics. Ligament laxity, which is a structural component, is this outlier of where orthotics actually have an appropriate time and place. Okay, hope that that answers that. David's question, hello, I've been following you in EBFA for about a year now, thank you very much. Um, are there any new technologies for people with lack of first MPJ joint space? Uh, he is degrading cartilage, limited range of motion, definitely need to work on opening up the hips and mobility, but there's definitely something going on in the big toe. So. With the big toe and having arthritis in the big toe, essentially you're starting to get this narrowing of the joint, which is limiting the range of motion, which will inherently limit step length. 
if you start to limit step length because of the big toe, your pelvis and your T-spine are going to lock up, right? We were talking about that. So as far as treatments that are natural and don't require any sort of orthotic or shoe, there's not much. There's not much. What I look at from a uh, intervention could be a dancer's pad a orthotic that has what's called a kinetic wedge or a reverse Morton's extension. Essentially, it's a, a cutout at the first metatarsal head to try to force the first metatarsal to plantar flex to allow the first MPJ to dorsiflex. So you're trying to hack the mechanics of the big toe is an option. You might want to look at rocker shoes like a Hoka. I know Hoka, 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 lots of cushion, but they're rocker based shoes. Um, I typically say if you're going to use Hoka to put a Naboso insole inside of it. So you are um, uh, reversing the restriction that you get from Hoka. So you can still feel your feet. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Um, otherwise, you're looking honestly at surgery. So like a joint replacement, a joint implant, or a decompression osteotomy. Uh, and happy to answer more of that, David, uh, via email if you want. Uh, Marta asks, older clients tend to cramp when foot issues are stimulated, when foot tissues are stimulated. I see this both in manual treatment and intrinsic strength exercises. Any insight in cramping and how to help the clients with the cramps? Um, so foot cramps can be either their foot type, lack of foot and tissue hydration, um, lack of kind of an electrolyte type imbalance. You want to be really careful with that. Um, I would say to start with something that's going to hydrate the tissue, maybe that revitive, maybe the power plate to bring vibration into it, maybe do um, slow gradual introduction of the level of stress that you're introducing. So we need to think of hydrate, hydrate, circulation, circulation, and then be very progressive on the foot strengthening. Uh, Diego asks again, what do you believe to be optimal ambulation speed, either meters or feet per second for greater than 70 years old, 80 year olds? What do you prefer outcome measures uh, for speed, uh, time, uh, timed up and go, uh, FGA, different balance ones? Um, so you can, there's a lot of speed ones that you can do. So kind of that timed uh, up and go. So they're trying to walk a certain meter by a certain time is one that you could do. Um, you could do if you, from like a client setting, it could be the speed that they're doing on the treadmill and that they're walking at. Um, so the speed that I try to keep people at, especially when I do gait assessments, I want people at a um, three miles per hour speed. So that would be how many minute miles is that kind of breaking down into, right? So it's, it's kind of relative also to their height and leg length, male versus female. So you want it to just be relative to that individual, but I would say the most controlled is probably that timed up and go one. Uh, Lenise says, how do you measure step length? How should the step, how long should the step length be so it doesn't affect the knee? So there are apps and high speed cameras and force plates that will measure step length. Um, it's very difficult to do it without technology. Um, so I would say that you would want to look at some of these systems if you're really looking to seriously bring it in. Um, a lot of the assessments that I do in my office, I actually don't use technology because I'm looking at it relative to that individual and how they're moving. And I'm looking for other patterns as far as an early heel lift. So I can often tell when they're picking their foot up a little bit too early, they're not getting a full first MPJ dorsiflexion, how much hip extension. Um, some of the apps you can actually 
freeze frame it, and then you're measuring the angles of how much hip extension. So instead of measuring step length, you're actually looking at how much hip extension and different rotations that you're getting with each step. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can do it. What I would say in a setting like what I'm speaking about here, it's hard to add these quantifiable measures into it. So it is, if you're going to quantify, you have to consistently quantify. If you're doing it more kind of with the naked eye, you just wanna be consistent at what you're following and looking at other patterns um, for that. And I feel like that's a whole webinar in itself. So it's, if, if that's too vague, I do apologize, but it's really hard to kind of include high specifics in uh, this type of setting, but definitely email me if you would like. Okay. Um, just look at the time. Okay, good with our time. Uh, Lana asks, have I, always, have I always used the big toe as a major first balance point in the body, but I teach a brain body program where their orientation is the second and third toe? Um, so the second toe is the midline of the foot. Uh, so I actually don't know what your question is, Lana. Uh, if you can word that in a different way, the midline of the foot is the second slash third toe. That's how you cue knee alignment and center of foot and how you reference movements of the foot relative to the foot's midline is the second. Um, but we propulse through obviously all of our MPJs, and it is the first MPJ that has maximum uh, range of motion. And it is the flexor hallucis longus that has three times the strength of the flexor digitorum longus, so the smaller digits. So if you want to reiterate that in a little bit different way. Uh, they use the first balance point as the Helix. Uh, well, yes. So don't worry about it. I think that um, if you're referencing the tripod and how we center our body weight over the medial foot, which is the first toe, the lateral foot, which is the fifth toe, and then the heel to get that tripod, that's what they're talking about. The second toe is referencing the midline of the foot. I'm sorry, that's all I can say, Lana, on that one, because I think I'm still confused on your question. Um, Joseph asked, what impact does number of steps taken have on gait efficiency? Yes. So to improve gait efficiency, you want to get into the fascial tissue. To optimally potentiate fascial tissue, you have to take a long enough step. So step length is directly correlated to the fascial component of movement efficiency. Number of steps per distance, you could say. So cadence, right, is if I have to take more steps to cover a distance and each of those steps is shorter, they're going to be more staccatic and I'm not getting full fascial potentiation. So I would instead rather have someone take less steps to get full good arm swing and lengthen and open up the T-spine and the pelvis versus a bunch of little steps that are not truly opening up. Um, so the impact that number of steps has on gait efficiency would be the more steps in a set distance, the less fascial that you would be getting into your pelvis and your T-spine, okay? Um, so they're probably working harder to keep that pace than they would be if they were taking longer steps. Okay, hope that answers your question. Um, Someone asked, do you need to use a purchase code on the Naboso site to receive the training courses? No. So what you will do is after you purchase on Naboso and you are ready for the free course, you will just email orders at naboso.com and say, I have made this purchase. This is the course that I would like. Okay. All right. And you are welcome, Erin. Okay. 
One more question, and then I'm going to wrap this up. So last question, again, all of this is recorded. So Alejandra's question is, I have neuromas and I've had the worst plantar fasciitis at times in my life. Oh, so sorry. I've had neuromas for 30 years. I do all these exercises and use toe spacers and other products. What shoes do you recommend? I have a wide toe box. Ultras have been great and Hoka. Um, I mean, those would honestly be the ones Hoka's probably what I would recommend. I'd recommend using a metatarsal pad as well. Uh, the toe spacers, you're doing that. The met pad, um, I would check that out. So a metatarsal pad, quarter inch thickness, use it with the Hoka, which is a stiff rocker base shoe. So you don't roll through the neuroma, but you roll through the stiffness of the shoe. Um, and then getting deep myofascial release into the intrinsics. Um, and again, that's a very specific recommendation that I'm giving Alejandra because of having neuromas for 30 years. Doesn't mean that I give that recommendation to everyone, but sometimes we need to um, kind of factor in uh, the reality of the situation for the client and guide our recommendations based off of that. Right. We're in an ideal world, Alejandra, I would want you in minimal shoes and moving barefoot as much as possible. But if you can't do that because of the current state of your neuromas, I need to give you advice that works for you right in your foot, which is where and why I'm saying Hoka, metatarsal pad, toe spacers and releasing your feet. Uh, and if you haven't done any injections, you may want to consider doing some injections, um, alcohol, stem cell, uh, cryoablation, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, different things. And you can message me privately if you would want. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Again, this will be sent out to everyone that recording. I will send out the information on our big toe webinar that we're going to do in two weeks. So do stay tuned for that. Don't forget about the uh, offer through Naboso and EBFA. Just email edu uh, orders at naboso.com after you make that purchase if you do make the purchase and I hope that you guys are doing amazing. Stay tuned for more free webinars and promotions that we're doing through both Naboso and DBFA. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day or evening.